Good evening, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. This, we're in the middle of our week of eclectic shows of different sorts of subjects, but tonight we are talking about Hermann Goring's younger brother, one of his uh, siblings, Albert Goring. And to join me tonight, you, uh, she's always famous on Twitter. She's part of Kathy Malarkey and all sorts of history projects and TV research and you name it, she does it. So uh, Olivia Smith is joining us again tonight. Hi, Olivia. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm good, thank you. How are you? That's a very nice introduction. <laughs> well, I try to be nice. Um, so, you know, when, when when you and I, I should point out to viewers, Olivia was part of the inspiration for putting these two weeks of shows together, giving a voice to some some newer historians and different historians within different walks of life and trying to open it up to get a more eclectic group of people involved. And um, so thanks for your help with that. And no um, it's, it's important that we get these different types of voices on. But in, I'm intriguing because I said, Olivia, I want you to do a show. And you chose Albert Goring, but kind of what? Why? Why? Why did you go down that route? What? What other? What did you? What other ideas did you consider that you dropped in favor of Albert Goring? Well, I thought about like something to do with the cultural kind of side of war because that's kind of what I have focused on before. But what? Um, research um for work right now i stumbled across albert and i was like this is such an interesting story and this is something i felt i hadn't heard much of myself and then when i had to do a lot of in-depth research for work i was like oh my god this is such a cool area of history i don't think people many people actually know about i didn't even know herman going had a brother so i was like this seems like a story it's worthwhile sharing because it's not your typical blood gore kind of depressing story either i mean everyone is up entitled to make their own opinions of it and obviously that's what the historical evidence is for but for me i was like this seems like quite a different positive story in a way and i thought that was important to shed a light on that you know history isn't always kind of just i don't know like sad and death in a way and also, we did talk about this before we went online, it's not always neat history, because this is mm -hmm. going to be the big discussion tonight, is where Albert Goring sits on the line between good guy and bad guy, because all of us sit on that line somewhere during our lives, we make decisions, we we get involved in things or don't get involved in things, and in a sense, his story, as we'll, we'll discover when you talk about it, is, a, is an example of the whole of Germany and the Third Reich, in that there are low, millions of people who are caught up in it, who are either rigidly for the regime or against the regime, or they're in the middle trying to make mm. life work, trying to just kind yeah. of exist right. and keep your family alive. And that's that complexity is what I'm really looking forward to getting to grips with because that it's we can all understand that. We we're in a world we we had the show I did last night about the Malarkey and Engelbert uh, book, the two veterans from opposing sides. We're in a world where we're split now. We're either pro Brexit or against Brexit. We're we're Biden or Trump. We're 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 COVID deniers or we're COVID safe. We're we're always split. There's but there a bandwagon people, every time. Yeah, so there are some people who don't really know where they sit. They sit in the middle and they kind of not sure which way to go. And I think this is it's kind of a story for them in that those people that don't quite know who go through life weighing up both sides and trying to make a decision on that i think it's it's interesting so as with all my guests you've prepared a powerpoint presentation and there's the graphic we started there so right. let's start with so albert goring younger brother of, of, of herman i'll let you start and then i will as i always do jump in with questions that i have and if anything yeah. comes up on on the on the sidebar there of interesting comments there's quite a few people watching colin and willie and rich and the usual suspects yeah. really lucy's watching so um i'll hand over to you and then we'll jump in when we think we've got something to say Brilliant. Well, okay. Well, what can I, I think my starting point is, if you're only just joining us, is did you even know Herman Goering had a brother? Because, like I said before, I had no clue. We all know about Herman. We know that he's one of Hitler's right-hand men. He's in charge of the Luftwaffe. But, you know, this isn't really about him tonight. We will touch upon him as we go, because I think it's interesting to draw a comparison between, kind of, between the two brothers. It's kind of like the analogy of, like, the good, the bad, the Goering, because I think that epitomizes them too perfectly. But, you know, we're going to talk about Albert Goering. And I think for a start, when I've done this research, like, Albert comes across to me as quite this, like, ambiguous personality. He was this multilingual socialite a music lover, a man of cinema in you know, Austria and Italy, and this businessman in Czechoslovakia. And I think Herman actually described him really well. He said that Albert is the antithesis of myself. You know, he was not politically or military interested. He was quite quiet, reclusive, melancholic, and even quite pessimistic. But in the words of Herman, he said, 
he's not a bad fellow, Albert. And I think that's quite a nice way to start on it. I think many of you might be a bit hesitant thinking, do we trust what Herman Goering's saying? Probably not. But I'll let you make that mind up for yourself because that's what history is all about, isn't it? You know, I'm not going to exactly. tell you what to think. I'd, I'd love to know what everyone thinks at the end of this. So I think my opinion really upon this is that I think he is a good guy. And I think there's evidence to show that Al but is a good guy and I think the interesting like you said Woody is the fact that people do stuff because they need to survive you know what the hell would you do back in the 1940s you're in the middle of Nazi Germany to survive would you just go along with it would you do whatever and I think there's all these elements that come into it and there's a lot of kind of fate as well as you might see just by chance or the fact that the one interesting thing for me is the world is a small small place but if we go right back to the beginning of the two you know we've got Herman and Albert they survived this kind of like aristocratic mess of a childhood their father Heydrich he enjoyed this distinguished kind of diplomatic career um, as a consul to German southwest Africa which is obviously today Nambia and he was often apart from the family he actually became quite a melancholic recluse his wife Fanny became infatuated with this physician Dr Herman von Eppenstein now he was at Fanny's side when Herman was born and he was there when and Albert was also born as well. And he announced that he would then become the godfather of these children and house them in this kind of his southern castle. So if you go on to the next slide, Woody. So this is it. You know, this is where the family spent most of their year. Bergven Veldenstein. Apologies if I butcher anything. There's a strong chance I will tonight. Um, but it was as imposing as you can see, like medieval bastion, you know, fairy tale castle in the kind of Austrian mountains. You know, their meals were announced by um, like a hunting horn, and the staff even adorned like medieval regalia. And when von Epstein kind of visited the Goerings here, he would always choose of the whole 24 rooms in this place, um, the one that was very close to Fanny's room, which fueled a lot of rumours within the um, the local little community, because everyone kind of gathered there at this castle that, you know, Fanny and him were having an affair. And there is this then belief around good friends and kind of even has been admitted by Albert himself, but we're still a little bit unsure that, you know, um, von Epstein is Albert's dad. So that would make him a quarter Jewish, which I think is just something to kind of bear in mind as we go on. And I know you find this quite interesting as well, Woody. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's just it adds another level of nuance and complexity to this. And even just about the like the name. I mean, when people mm. just come in and say they didn't know you had a brother, because now anybody in the world they hear the name Goring, they think all oh, bad, sinister. But there's a whole family of people that whose whose name have now been associated with the one horrifically evil guy within that family, it, it, and and there's a lot more to the family. So um, anyway, I'll let you continue. So this, yeah, it's an amazing castle. I'd I'd like to go and stay there. Yeah, that would be a lovely place to go visit, wouldn't it? Um, bear with me. I did just get told I have unstable internet, so. Yeah, you disappeared off screen for half a second. Oh, I disappeared. Okay. Oh, so did I. I was like, where's he gone? <laughs> but let's no, we're, 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 carry we're, we're on. That's fine. If I go off when you're talking, I guess that's not too bad. Um, <laughs> let's just say we can't interact but um yeah so the interesting thing is we've got these brothers who've come from quite a very similar beginning and at school Herman was this rebellious boy you know he was ill at ease in the confines of a classroom he banked from one boarding school to another and apparently in his final one he cut the strings of like every violin and cello there and then they kind of then ended up sending him to military school but in contrast Albert was said to be like quite a sad boy you know he preferred a book sat in the back of the class and this security of the inside so as they're growing up we've now got the brothers kind of forming their separate paths and lives and if you go to the next slide on here would you um you know Albert, we, we all know about Herman. I'm not going to go too much of it about his efforts in the First World War. But Albert was a communication engineer in the First World War. And afterwards, he enrolled um, in 1919 at the Technical University in Munich um, to study mechanical engineering, which is kind of 
interesting when we go on to a bit of his later life and especially what he did in the Second World War too. But it was here he kind of rubbed these shoulders with like future leaders of the Third Reich and that included like Heinrich Himmler and who was then an agronomy student um, active in fraternities. You know, these places must have been like this breeding ground for this budding kind of students of the nationalist socialist movement. And Albert always kind of appeared to be politically passive and I think you could definitely say that he studied these guys probably a bit intently you know maybe a bit aware of his brother but as he was gaining an education and forming a career we know that Herman was circulating in this Munich um, beer hall scene and you know he was listening to the rhetoric against the Weimar uh, government and the postal reparations of the Treaty of Versailles etc and then in 1922 it's when he's particularly you know he met Hitler and this their famous love affair kind of blossomed at that point and it was clear from the off that Albert did not approve of his brother's activities you know I think we're very lucky to have a lot of accounts from Albert's friends so we kind of know maybe some of his insights that we because there wasn't actually a lot documented from him himself and so um his friend Ernest Newbeck who was a Jew um a Jewish film producer and he recalls that he f- um Albert was like outraged when Herman joined the Nazi party and in 1923 he said Herman has teamed up with his son of a bitch Hitler and you know the two brothers apparently didn't really speak for a long time and I think Albert did kind of feel a bit betrayed as a brother and a representative of the Goering kind of family and he would say to his other friend um, Albert oh I have this brother in Germany who is getting involved with that bastard Hitler and he's going to come to a bad end if he kind of uh, continues that way which I think is quite God, we know from hindsight that he did. But it's very interesting. He was having this way before anything happened. And Herman was really interesting. He actually rationalized the fact that the brothers didn't speak to each other um, because of Albert's attitudes to the party. It's like he accepted it. And he believed that, you know, neither party was angry at each other. And he said it was like a separation due to the situation, which I think is a really interesting mm. way for him to sit back and perceive it quite ignorant, perhaps, as well. But if we jump ahead to kind of like 1930, We've got Albert living in Vienna at the time and he's working in the film industry, notably a lot around of like a lot of Jewish people. And things started kind of changing for him at this point. So we've got 1938 to be a bit contextualization. We've got the Anschluss where, you know, Nazis annex Austria. Um, we'll come back to that. Well, that's a bit later on, but and looming war was obviously there and the two brothers kind of met at Albert's Lodge in a peaceful town um, northwest of Vienna and Albert was this exhausted mess ever since like the first Oscar actually appeared in Vienna he had been working tirelessly to arrange exit visas and funds for Jewish friends and he even come head to head with like the Nazi thugs in Vienna because they were making elderly Jewish women um, they were mocking them forcing them to scrub the sco- the co- cobblestone streets in, um, on their knees and do you know what Albert did and I lo- I kind of love this so much is he reportedly got on his knees and he began scrubbing with these women and so when the officers asked who he was you could just imagine the panic they had when they realised that they had let Herman Goering's brother scrub the streets of Vienna and I think this is kind of like an interesting point to realise that the name is either a hindrance or a protective kind of element here. And so in contrast, you know, Herman's there, he's brimming with excitement. He's just arrived to Austria with so much fanfare and he's delivering like this huge speech about anti-Semitism. And so this excitement turned to Herman, and I, when I read this made me laugh so much, it felt like he turned into the genie out of Aladdin because he actually granted each of his family members a wish. And But this really soured his mood because Albert and their sister Olga pleaded for Herman to intervene on behalf of the Archduke, um, Joseph of Ferdinand of Austria, who was actually then detained in Dachau concentration camp. So apparently Herman was very embarrassed, but the next day the Archduke was free. And this is a little bit of a pattern you're going to see as we continue as well, um, which kind of really, again, brings up some interesting kind of nuances and discussion points about Herman, but yeah. that could be a whole talk in itself. And like, I, I like, you know, he, he's you've just said he, he's, he's, he's intervening because he doesn't like the treatment of these Jewish women. But I wonder how much of that is because he knows he's not going to get into too much trouble because he is, he's got a bigger brother who's part of this. So I like the angle you're going with there because a complete stranger 
interfering like that could just be taken away. And race, we all know anybody who's read anything about the, 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 the development of the Nazi party is that people who spoke out against it from within quickly met an end. You know, there's lots of people yeah. in Hitler's circle who just suddenly disappear in the early 30s because they've, they've, they've gone against the, the trend of the party. Mm. So I'm not saying what Albert do, was doing wasn't noble because of course it was but he has got a bit of a kind of get out of jail card free thing which Definitely. is giving him a little bit of a of a of kudos there and, and herman would not want the publicity of a rebellious younger brother standing against him it undermines his stature as well isn't it if you know that there's 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 sort of press i, I said oh but hang on your younger brother is against what you're standing for so they they've agreed to that their friendship their, their their connection as brothers is is struggling a bit, but they can't mm. they can't remove the fact they are brothers. They can't no, deny that it exists. So they've got together. to kind of play with the cards they've dealt. They've got to accept the fact that they're on different paths and they're kind of it's opposite ends of the, of the it's opposite sides of the coin in a sense. And as you said earlier, they represent the opposite sides of how they've grown up. And also yeah, under the point, I will go back to you in a minute. Is nice. that Albert was very much a he enjoyed the good life, he enjoyed the wine. And the oh, champagne. he's a womanizer, yeah. And that's something that, again, when we we forget that the early stages of the Third Reich was a lot of partying as well. It is, if you're a young or youngish businessman or whatever, there's an attractiveness about the, the, the partying side of it, which we forget now because we know that what it led to the Holocaust, but there was that kind of boys' club going away early stage. And he could have easily been tempted by that just because of the access to, well, women and drink, possibly. Yeah, definitely. But, but he resisted it because he felt he... he rec and what I'm saying is he recognised the political motives of it early on when other people didn't necessarily see this dark yeah. side. He so abused he's, it when he could. Yeah, he's he's obviously a very wise and very um, astute. He's he's very good yes, at assessing definitely. the bigger picture there. Which, let's be honest, in a, in Germany in 1930s, a lot of people who are being completely swept along and not not seeing the wood for the trees. They're, they're yeah. So he's yeah he's it's anyway. I'll, I'll hand back to you. No, no, it's still it's it's so interesting, isn't it? Especially when you don't like you're saying you're looking in the context of the period. You're like, God, this guy. It's like he's he's obviously he can just get away with it and i guess how fortunate he was in a way to be able to do what he does and when we carry on you'll see there's certain things you're like how the hell did they just not shoot him or whether but i'm not gonna give too much away no spoilers yeah, yeah, yeah. yet well we'll, but, we'll we'll carry on yeah so as we carry on so we've got the nazis and as we know austria wasn't kind of their sole conquest the next on their list was the sedaton land and you know, this was obtained in October 1938 and by March 1939, the remainder of Czechoslovakia. And Hitler acquired within this kind of taking over the land, a huge armament industry in Czechoslovakia. So I've tried to kind of mark on with a little X marks a spot for a place called the Skoda Works in Pilsen, which I put on the picture on the side there. Um, this is significant, but we'll come back to this. And really, Czechoslovakia was very important for the provision of armament goods because Bohemia and Bavaria, particularly, were not really heavily bombed during the war. They were just too far away from England. Yeah. You know, that heavy bombers just couldn't bring their loads, not really until the end of the war. And, you know, these armament plants didn't really suffer losses until the final days. And one of the biggest factories that the Nazis did obtain was the Skoda Works in Pilsen. And so... You can see I've tried to mark on. And I think what well, something I found really interesting that really stressed how significant this was to the Nazis is that Hermann Goering actually summarized the Czechoslovakia game to Mussolini and Siandro in April 1939. And he said basically that because of Germany's action, the situation of both Axis countries was now ameliorated and among other reasons because of their like kind of economic possibilities within which this kind of like transfer to Germany of this great production capacity of Czechoslovakia. So that then contributes towards a considerable strengthening of the axis against the Western powers. And, you know, the reason this was so significant as well is that the German war effort was not really prepared for a total war by 1939. You know, they'd only really been rearmoring for six years by this point. And we've then got this massive rapid military expansion was bad to put a strain on German. It's called Germany's kind of natural resources. So the absorption of like the Czech industry raised Germany's percentage. I think I read something like an in, as an industrial world kind of production to around like 15%. 
And so that's huge when you're kind of obviously planning to do what we know Germany went on doing. And like there were some stats I read, it was something like they acquired like over 1,500 aircraft, nearly 500 tanks, you know, hundreds of anti-aircraft guns, machine guns, millions of rifles, artillery and rifle rounds as well. And I think it said something like, in theory, this is enough to equip at least like 30 German divisions. So if this wasn't going to set you up to go wage your kind of like blitzkrieg, then God, what it was. And Skoda is really significant within this because they are now then turning out arms to the Third Reich in quantity. You know, they're producing field guns, guns that would feature actually along the Atlantic Wall. Um, we've also got like um, ammunition and the famous Panzer 35 tank. You know, this saw then obviously went to see action in Poland, in the Battle of France in 1940, and even the early stages of the invasion of the Soviet Union. But like it was at this time, Skoda Works was one of the largest armament kind of complexes in Europe. And some of the statistics claim between like 25,000 to 40,000 people worked at the factory over the course of the war. So I think this shows like on scale, this place is bloody huge. Like, yeah. I think you're probably all wondering what the hell has this got to do with Albert? Because, you know, if he didn't want to be a part of the Nazis, so why would he maybe want to even be a part of work? that would involve the Nazis, right? So what the kind of Nazis did, they're installed in Prague and the Skoda management actually heard of this plan that basically they're going to dismember and relocate their whole company and something had to be done. So a guy called Bruno Seletsky, who was Skoda's export director, had a brainwave. He had this old friend, Albert Goering, and he had recently visited him in Rome. And the true two had actually first met in Argentina in 1930 when Albert was kind of in South America doing business. And just a little side note, I know I said Albert was a part of like the film industry, but he actually worked for kind of some big armament kind of manufacturing factories at the same time. But it's more his interests and friendships that brought him into the film industry side. So that's Bruno. He suggested that they accept into Skoda's employment his friend Albert Goering, who he knew was an anti-Nazi, an Austrian citizen, and also, well, he's Herman Goering's brother. That could be very valuable. It's quite a clever power move from Bruno, and without hesitation, they offered Albert the job. And they'd hoped that Albert would prevent this liquidation of the company. And really, for them, I think it's quite convenient. And again, this is all about timings here. I think for Albert, his whole story is about very interesting timings of how things work for him because he was really fed up of working at the Vienna studios at the time because now it's he's churning out Nazi propaganda so if your guy is a really anti-Nazi the last thing he wants to do is do that so he immediately accepted their offer and he became the director of exports for Skoda and if, if you skip to the well kind of yeah this shows the scale of the factory it's bloody huge like yeah. when you see it really is um so if you go to the next photo it's just kind of a, um, again looking at the size of this stuff they weren't just churning out small armaments they were dealing with big big stuff and this is a historic kind of works as well it's predating kind of the austrian hungarian empire um first world war armaments as well and this is really like a huge place of kind of modern infant like armament inventory as well um so if we go to the next one the kind of feel like we only have one photo of albert it's quite rare to find photos of him so i thought yeah there are many yeah a good yep. one yeah to source um but at the end of the day one thing, I, again, another nuance of this is that Albert was a businessman. And this is where, again, I can see people's views differ about him. The business he was conducting was contributing directly to the German war effort. He maintained a profitable kind of business relationship with Herman. All aside of whatever the hell's going on with the family, they were supplying weapons from Skoda to the Wehrmacht. And, you know, records survive of a gender of a meeting between the two brothers in 1943. The subjects included a shipment of like 200 tanks to Bulgaria. We're going to ship arms to Hungary. And, you know, this development of new arms and anti aircraft weapons. And, you know, whether the whole capacity of Skoda was even being successfully utilized. But what the Skoda workers have said about Albert is that he was planning for his personal future. He wasn't a Nazi. He didn't believe that the Germans would win the war. So he tried to establish some channels for like a post-war period of peaceful production. You know, he actually wanted to keep carrying on working for Skoda is what they all believed. So I think that's quite nice. They picked up on this. And you know, this job paid well. And Albert made the move to Prague. Um, you know, he had, had these new colleagues and they were all... Those who didn't know him were quite astonished of his attitudes towards the Nazis. And apparently in the Pilsen kind of factory, Albert made it clear where his sympathies lay. So in his office, there was no picture of Hitler. And apparently that was what everyone had to have. And when there was um, 
conferences and business meetings were held, he actually expressed the opinion that the Nazi management was incompetent and that Hitler would surely lose the war. And you can imagine the shock of the people at the time being like, are you really saying this? Like, how is he getting away from this? And apparently there's even this story that he would never return, like, the Nazi salute in and out of the factory. And, you know, one a story kind of reports that he was in Bucharest and two Nazi officers saw him and recognised him as Herman's brother. And they obviously raised their arm, said, Heil Hitler, um, as to be expected. And Albert just straight face replied to them going, you can kiss my ass." I mean, I'd love to believe that this is true because there's defiance. And as we're talking earlier on, Woody, like, contextually, you're like, how the hell? Are they getting away with this when we hear so many atrocious stories of like people maybe not even having the right travel cards and then they're being detained like it's and yet he's just so blasé and free to kind of do it it's incredible it is except not having a, a photo of hitler isn't helping anybody it's not no. you know you're i'm being devil's advocate now you're still your factory is still turning out guns. Your factory is still exactly. turning out guns. I know you're going to come on that later on, but saying, oh, well, I don't really support this, it's all very well and good, but it's not, It's not. what does it count for? How does that, yeah. it, it's, 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 it's an interesting survival. figure. Yeah, it's a survival thing, you know, was he just going along because he was protected, but then he was still, you know, how were you doing this? It's so interesting because, like, I think we can never really know because we will hopefully never be in that situation. You know, but... This anti kind of Nazi sentiment really, I think, was embedded within the Skoda works. And obviously, we know there's a lot with the Czechoslovakian kind of like resistance and everything. And Albert, if we go to the next photo, it's kind of a nice little one of him in his office. And he really insisted that all people, apparently, in a matter of rank, position, be announced to him before entering the room. And um, a woman called Carol kind of Sabota later said that this high-ranking SS officer one day apparently arrived at Skoda and quickly entered into his room. And she was able to uh, like kind of block him. And in this rage, he expelled the Nazi from his room ordered him to wait outside. And what he does, he sits down with Carell and he says, come in. And they talk really calmly about the weather. They talk about his family and they both examine some of apparently his photo albums. And then about 30 or 40 minutes left, like after she said, right, you can now let him in to talk to me. And I find that really interesting. You know, what is a power play? What's going, is it an ego thing? You know, there's so many things you can really assess to bring out here. But I kind of think that Skoda was his safety net where he could resist. If you're conducting so much, you're producing things that they're not going to have too much of an eye on you. How much can you then try and get away with? It's like a naughty kid in school. It's like, what can you do to keep pushing that teacher's buttons before they clock on perhaps? And, mm. you know, you know, one another example at the Skoda is like the resistance. So there's this guy called Jan Moravec, and Moravec was a Skoda engineer, and his brother was actually already involved in the resistance and persuaded him to join. So at Skoda, he would actually be providing information of what the workers on the shop floor should do, and he was providing information to pass back to Czech intelligence in London. And in the summer of 1940, his parents were actually accused of all things keeping a pig on the farm and obviously that was a very serious kind of offence in wartime and their farm was such and to his fortune he was actually in Yugoslavia when his house was ransacked and so the government or uh, well, the Gazapo actually found weapons documents even including blueprint of like this submachine um machine gun and evidence of even a substantial deposit to a national city bank in uh, Buenos Aires a punish for this you know was could be the death Albert was alerted, and with little time and costs, he managed to find a vacancy at the Skoda factory in Bucharest. He secured a pri private plane and safe travel for all of Moravec's family, and he got him his job and got him his freedom. He was constantly, I think, kind of working with members of the Czech resistance and to try and do this to fight because even after the war a lot of them testified that he actually used knowledge gleaned from his brother to tell them the resistance people of secrets of u-boat shipyard nazi plans to invade, invade the soviet union and this was passed on to moscow and london mm. so this guy was like tempting fate constantly and this wasn't the only thing that's going on at skoda you know apparently a real testament from the employees is that they were so grateful to albert because he had this real human treatment and he always gave like he gave to all the czech people and anyone of no any nationality he was you know he wasn't like that and if we go to the next photo it'll be well, the well, just, 
We well, will. And uh, there's just two comments coming in that are interesting. So Lucy Bethridge cool. Dyson is saying, and I want to elaborate on this, is that he's using his position from within to influence from within the organisation yeah. uh, quietly and subtly. Um, and another comment there from um, Super Doctor 14 saying that he'd had a dangerous job in the First World War as an engineer, so he, he could even be such. So he's not he's not easy to intimidate. So yeah, having that, played the devil advocate comment a minute ago saying he's still there, he's not you know just not having a photo of Hitler isn't doing anything correctly. I'm thinking about factories now. We know mm. that in the famous Rosie the Riveter factories in in America, the ma the radio stations had worked out that if they played over the course of an hour songs with a faster rhythm than a slower rhythm, so sort of people would instinctively work the machines to a faster beat because it's just natural, and they would be able to make more B-17s by playing jive music than if they played sweet ballads. So, so we have documentary proof that, that a positive atmosphere in a factory mm -hmm. produces more goods. So conversely, if he is setting up this factory in a kind of a yeah we don't care about hitler and everything's a bit relaxed if he's subconsciously creating a feeling of it doesn't really matter then perhaps everybody's working a little bit slower pace and rather than producing 25 tanks a day they're producing 19 tanks a day maybe which oh, well, means i'll come to that <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not gonna come to that. so th this is all the thing that there's a lot there's a level of complexity here where he's playing a game where he's as you say the naughty kid He's seeing what he can get away with, trying to, to not let the attention, the spotlight go on him. Because if the spotlight goes on him, he's Game gone, isn't he? If he really yeah. does something really wrong, if he deliberately sabotages something or he deliberately gives information to the resistance, he's gone. No, no having a bigger brother is going to save you if he's actually actively supporting the... And we all know that the Pilsen factory is very, very close to Prague where... The Heydrich assassination. He could have he could have got involved in that. In which case, he's dead, isn't he? So, yeah, he's playing this game maybe where he's he's letting suspicion go away from himself, and then he's in control. He's the master planner, controlling mm -hmm. everything exactly how he wants. I know you're going to bring up that point now, but I just thought I'd address those two points there coming. No, in. it's it's so interesting because I think there's a lot of potential there's, because there's not a lot really documented about him, which is such a shame. I think that opens up for a lot of interpretation and that's what's brilliant about history, isn't it? We want to hear people's perspectives on it all because I think there is a lot that can really be discussed here. And kind of moving on to another element of his resistance, because to me, I think this is one of the really key things about him. It's like, what can he keep doing? And he, and I kind of, I, you know, I said in my tweet earlier on, this man's in kind of touching base with so much history of the Second World War. Sometimes when we look at individuals, they're really like focused on one area. And I think he is kind of going on with a lot. And so one of the things that he would do is, especially hearing reports of the concentration camps. Now, he would actually confront Herman and apparently he just brushed the claims aside. And I think one of his kind of greatest exploits of his position and his power is what he did in the camps, and um, particularly at the, I'm so sorry if I pronounce this wrong, but the, Fer I actually don't know if I can pronounce it, the Ferenstadt concentration camp. I put, sorry. I, yeah, tried. I don't know either. Yeah. No, I'll try to get it up in a comment. I'll let you guys know. But um, you know, they had 33,000 people who died here during the Holocaust. And, you know, Albert, one of the things he did do is that he would actually sign transit documents that allowed enemies of the right to kind of escape and stuff. He would forge Herman's signature. But one of the things he would do is so he would drive up with a lorry or, you know, a convoy of lorry, some kind of says and to this camp, and he'd go, I'm Albert Goering of this from the skoda works and i need workers he'd fill the trucks with lorries workers and for those of you who don't know to give it a context you know a lot of these kind of factories within germany and the kind of within the nazi reign did use concentration camp labor to run the factories as well so this is quite a typical action it's not very unheard of because albert's doing yeah. it but what he would then do is he'd fill the lorry with all the workers the commandment would obviously go if the go ahead it was herman goering's brother why would you not like go against him but what they didn't know is he'd drive off with all these laborers he'd go find the wood or a secluded area and he'd let them escape he would continue to supply jewish people with exit permits and he'd help their kind of transport to get out of Nazi Germany. And to me, I can, again, see the questions coming up about this. You know, well, 
if he knew what was going on in the camps, why didn't he do more? If he had this power, why didn't he go further with it? But in my mind, I kind of analyzed this a bit as like the Enigma Code. As I was saying to you earlier, Woody, like you, they couldn't give away to the Nazis that they'd hacked their system. So they had to be selective in what they did. And to me, I think there's an element of what Albert done his best within his remit without giving it away too much. But he's kind of just, it's like what Lucy said, he's you becoming the power within. And so I think he really did try to make this active effort for, you know, the Jewish people. And going to the camps wasn't the only thing he did. He apparently actually went to Herman's office in Berlin um, to hurry a favour on behalf of even a Jewish friend or a political prisoner. And he'd manipulate Herman's ego, playing on this kind of sense of familial duty. And, you know, I think Herman was, again, this safety net for Albert. He knew he could play because he would go to Herman and say, Herman, you're so big, you're so powerful. And, you know, here's this Jew. He, he's a good Jew. You know, doesn't he doesn't belong on a concentration camp. Can't you just sign this paper? And Herman would say, okay, this is absolutely the last time I'm doing this. Don't come back. And a month later, Albert would be back. And I kind of wonder, again, here's another thing that you can, like, interpret. Well, did Herman do this out of kindness? But then you look at all of his involvement, especially within the Holocaust, and you're like, well, how the hell could he? Or was it simply that he wants to show off to his younger brother, as some people have interpreted? Was it a power play from Herman himself being like, wow, I'm so flattered my younger brother's coming up to me and asking for help? It's a very interesting thing. But then again, Albert is still just using this power he had. And as you mentioned earlier on, you know, this kind of resistance was kept going on inside the Skoda works. Lines of production or like administrative areas always took more days than needed to be kind of completed. Um, Carell, his kind of secretary who I mentioned earlier on, said that Albert looked the other way to some of the Czech employees if they made the wrong translations of catalogues or they forgot to do tasks that they'd assigned, uh, left work on their desks or lost important documents, you know, they were risking these lives. And by mid kind of 1944, the effects of especially the Allied strategic bombing in Germany began to kind of be felt at Skoda. You know, you've got an armament factory that can still produce. It's not been affected as yet. But these Czech workers were suddenly kind of thinking, the Allies, are, they're going to do this. I think they're going to win. And so I think they were daring to kind of stay away from work, which is really interesting. So they began a bit of like a slowdown, as you mentioned, Woody. So actually they had like this monthly goal of say like 500 tank destroying vehicles right and then they only reached about 145 a month and Albert was just there turning a blind eye to it or you know this chronic production even of like dud artillery shells or anti-aircraft rounds he was kind of like just let it go on but it, but it's again I'm being a devil's advocate here it's yeah, very it easy to say those things but actually concrete because they're all factories within the third reich are struggling with production they're all yeah. because the, the quality of materials is going down the transport infrastructure yeah. is so other factory owners could say yeah we're trying if you want to make a case to say that albert is a big hero cutting down production you can make it but you could also if you wanted to put the counter aside and say yeah, yeah. but we could also put those um that, that output down to the conditions anyway saying that he's i'm not saying he wasn't responsible for it but it's it's very difficult to actually attribute it to him mm. definitely yeah no definitely. there's he, a lot of context out, and he actually assassinated a third right leader you could say that happened or if he went out and he blew up a, if he put a stick of dynamite in a machine and blew it up you could kind of know but just saying we're producing well they're, they're producing less I'm not saying he didn't do it. I'm just so saying this places, whole but... subject is about interpreting things the way mm. you want to interpret them. And that is such an example of how history is. It's like, yeah. is Patton a good general? Is Monty a bad general? It's all about opinions and, and, and the subjective nature of it. And so Albert Goering is, it's hard, without bringing him back and put it, get, sitting him in a chair and saying, so Albert, you know, with the, on a lie detector, what are you up to now? What's your play here? Is it about power? When you went to see your brother, was it about getting over one over on mm. him? Did it, we can't know, but it doesn't make the subject any less fascinating. Even if we can't draw any definitive conclusions, it is just incredibly fascinating as people are commenting, oh, watching. That's but that's what I think is great about this. I mean, I've kind like I said at the start, I do kind of think he is a good guy, but that's my interpretation. You know, I think there's a hundred percent an argument that could be made that he wasn't, and I've kind of touched upon it. Like, you know, there's so many elements that you can be like, 
oh god like really was he and as you've you know you've mentioned Woody and that's the brilliant thing of history it's why we hear we have healthy discussions and we debate it's brilliant and one of the things I can probably think you're all maybe thinking of at this point is like how the hell was this guy getting away with it and mm. you know he was doing lots regardless of if it was whatever his intention was you know he was still doing stuff that was going against the kind of the third Reich and the Nazis wasn't he well as he was suspected and rightly so there was he the Gestapo did think that he was sabotaging Skoda Works. And so in 1944, there was actually a death warrant that went out for, o uh, for Albert and they demanded his execution on site. So he was on the run, hiding in Prague, and apparently Herman dropped everything to save him. And Albert said that his brother told him this was the complete last time he could do this because his position had now been shaken by this. And he had to personally ask Himmler to get involved to smooth the entire matter over. And overall, there was about, I think, four arrest warrants that were issued um, in Albert's name during the war. Yeah, he was never convicted. I think Big Brother kind of would always come step in and however politically damaging it might have been for Herman. But if we kind of go on to the next slide it's obviously we know the war kind of comes to an end if you any any aviation geeks out here this one's for you um because skoda was kind of involved in one of the last kind of interesting bombing raids of the war but skoda itself obviously huge target for allied strategic bombings and as the war progressed you know the allies were creeping closer and closer to the factory even in 1943 you know bomber harris sent out 300 lancasters to uh, bomb Pilsen and Von Skoda Works and they actually made a 12 mile error um, and ended up bombing like a really large mental hospital that they fought with Skoda Works. Um, a lot of people kind of died. It was one of these kind of unfortunate things that happened in war. Um, and again, at the end of May 1943, they tried to do another big bomb of it. Again, they missed, you know, it kind of seems when you, I've read the kind of the accounts of some of these guys um, who were trying to get Skoda and it seemed like such an impossible target for them to hit for some reason. I always find that really interesting. You know, they knew exactly where it was, but they just kind of kept missing. But that final blow came on the 25th of April. Oh, yesterday, um, uh, 1945. And we've got the 8th Air Force and they've launched their last heavy bomber combat mission in the European theatre. And so this photo was taken of the bombers here. And we've got Boeing um, kind of B-17s and from the 324th Bomb Squadron. And they're flying in formation on the way to Pilsen. And I found this photo was brilliant. You know, it's so great to see it in colour as well. And so we've got the spring of 1945. The war is closing to an end. We know this. But I think for the Americans and the Brits, they were obviously worried. Maybe this there's this armor factory. But another element, I think, to their worry was like, crap, do we really want the Soviets to have this in their hands? Like, if we destroy this, it will take that option out. And obviously, it's kind of one of those really early chess moves in the Cold War yeah, and what's yeah. going on. And so we've got these kind of, the, you've got your Mustangs. They were deployed the kind of the day before to drop warning leaflets all over to the workers of the factory. And so the next day on the 25th, the BBC, this is what I find so interesting, actually radioed in a warning to Czech workers. And so on that morning, um, the kind of BBC bulletin said, Allied work bombers are out in great strength today. Their destination is Skoda Works. Skoda Workers get out and stay out until the afternoon. And I have read that this is one of the first and only times a warning naming the target has actually been broadcast ahead of American heavy bombers. God, if anyone knows that to be right or wrong, please let me know because I just find that utterly fascinating. In terms of military targets, possibly. Yeah, I mean, we, we they yeah. drop on maybe on corn, places like that, saying we're bombing civilians, but not, I don't think, a strategic military target. But again, there's no. people watching like Pat who would know that better than me, but maybe. Yeah, but... I'd love to if that's clarified. That'd be great. Yeah. It's just, so, it's just um... like I've never heard of that before. I thought it was fascinating. But and, and definitely these... this part of you're definitely right. It's part of the post war. It's the che it's the part of the next war. It's a big you know, the Czechoslovakia is going to become, really? as we know, uh, a, a, a pawn in the next war as well, uh, yeah. as did Poland. All those poor countries there that just almost have no break. One war just kind of go becomes straight into the next one without any any time to catch your breath. It's a tragedy, really. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And so. These bombers, particularly, they 
they did it. Their results worked and they annihilated Skylarks, to say the least. And I think it said that the accuracy of this bombing resulted in around 70% of the Skylarks plant was destroyed. You know, there was workshops were hit. Um, you know, there's only really kind of, they said about 13 buildings were left unscathed. And this is some of the huge things. You know, we're talking about the workshops that were building the tanks and everything. Um, but the mission served its purpose at an expense of six people who did die unfortunately but we know obviously i think six people in terms of when i said earlier on between 25 to 40 thousand were working at the factory you weigh that up and you think maybe that bbc kind of announcement did do good so it's interesting but not long after the bombing now obviously we know this is the end of april uh the end of war is coming and so on two days after VE Day, May the 10th, Albert had surrendered himself over to um, the US. I think you skip to the next one. Yeah, we've got his arrest photo and since their kind of surrender to the US Army, both Albert and Herman have been kept in solitary kind of confinement and apparently one of the last times they saw each other was in a prison in Germany before actually going their separate ways and I won't get into too much about Herman but like as we know from between November to uh, 1945 to October 1946 Herman appeared before judges at the Nuremberg trials and he committed suicide the night before his trial um so, well, his execution uh, 15th October 1946 and Albert though I think this is to me the most interesting part of his story um so he was summoned by the Americans to explain his conduct of the war. And I kind of think, picture this, right? You've got Herman Goering's brother. You've really recently found out what the hell Herman Goering has been getting, even though you might have known about it, but he's just laid out all this truth kind of in the Nuremberg trials. And you're thinking, well, surely the brother of him must have been involved, right? And so Albert's in this interrogation room in late 1945 and to fend himself, he stunned the interrogators by giving them a handwritten list of 34 people that he had claimed to have helped escape the Nazis. If you go to the next photo, please, that's, we can see the first 18 names of this. And two big names kind of stand up. We've got Dr. Kirk, um, and as the, who was the former Chancellor of Austria. And obviously, as mentioned earlier on, we've got the Archduke Joseph Ferdinand. And this is an alphabetical chart list of their name, occupation, hometown, citizenship, and the last place particularly that Albert had seen them. And he actually titled this list, um, People Whose Life or Existence I Put Myself at Risk to Save. Now, the Americans, I think, saw this and were a bit like, I don't know what we how convenient in this, obviously. Yes. <laughs> yeah like oh you've suddenly got this like this is um you'll kind of get out of jail card really isn't mm. it like it's quite literally that um and there was an investigation and they were kind of saying that you know he's this obviously the brother of Herman and they said he kind of what well, they worded it in the sense that it constitutes a clever piece of rationalization you know that they were leaving it was a bit of a whitewash to them he kind of I don't know, it was just they were just saying that there was a lot of suspicion from the Americans that Albert had actually done saving people because he wanted money or he'd done it as a reward in some way or another and I mean, another ben, ben main said earlier ben main said if you have had there's a 50 page report the allies produced about the interrogation that is just and his relationship with yeah. her which is interesting and clearly yes, at the time they, they they couldn't He's obviously a very clever guy at not presenting his full side to anybody and kind of bending mm. with the breeze and 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 survive. He's, he's a born survivor, I think, as well. In in that he'll definitely, which which isn't a bad thing. I mean, being a good a survivor is a good thing, but he's it just makes him more interesting that this he's because on the one hand this is his perfect defense, and yet he's already got it ready, which kind of undermines it somehow yeah. it's, 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 it's uh... but could you imagine if you were in the Nuremberg like kind of prison thing you're thinking like okay I have done x y and z and I did do good in a way and I've saved people perhaps like but how would you do it and he's a lot kind of create this elaborate list going through like you know he's got a name but their dates where he last saw them as well I think that's the detail in that is so interesting of like he went this far and I think I can understand why the Americans were very suspicious you know apparently they said he talked too much he volunteered all this information that they didn't ask of him and they said that he told this brilliant story that was kind of not convincing like who were these witnesses as well and 
he really thought this would secure his release and obviously he remained in turn and there are two forms of evidence that actually arose that went in his favour and the first was Kurt Pilzer who was with his family had escaped to the United States and he actually wrote to Nuremberg prosecutors to say Albert saved me like and pleaded for his case and the second one which I think and I said at the start is a case of god this world is small and this is it so Albert's kind of case was then handed over to an American intelligent officer called Major Victor Parker and Major Parker went to go visit Albert in prison now to give a little context Victor Parker um his name and and he was a refugee whose real name was Paschkis. And his aunt, Sophie, had converted to Catholicism and married a composer called Franz Lehar. Now, the Lehar, if you look closely, are number 15 on Albert Goering's list and of those who he had helped save. Now, the interrogator, obviously Major Parker, had heard from his aunt, Sophie, that Hermann Goering's brother, Albert, had indeed saved Jewish people and tried to help them escape from the concentration camps. And so this good Goering, fantastical kind of stories were suddenly validated by the one man who was sent to interrogate him. You know, what are the chances of that happening? You know, yeah. isn't, I just find that to me, I'm like, I remember reading that and thinking, my God, you just can't believe how that paths have crossed over like that. It's just incredible. Yeah. But even though, so I think the Americans kind of, we're like right well we've got a good substantial bit of evidence here but the czech post-war government they actually they accuse him for being an accomplice at skoda with herman and this is again i said a lot of the skoda workers had a lot of lovely things to say about him and i think that's to me i'm i maybe i'm seeing the best of everyone but i kind of see those as lovely testaments perhaps and they actually wrote a big kind of like petition asking the Czech government to release him. Albert's still on trial, but all of these kind of Skoda colleagues and resistance members came forward to testify there um, for him. And one of them was Skoda's chief executive, Hans Modra. And it said, he said that Albert helped most of the families, um, especially those who are in prison, Skoda workers, and helped them whatever way they could, even if they didn't know it was Albert. And other test others that testified that Albert undermined the Nazi occupiers passed on information to aid the resistance and you know this really helped Albert to kind of get mm. out of it and he was released and so but I think the ironic kind of thing is is that we've seen a man who's used this name going to get him through so much in such an awful kind of time that now flip it on its head afterwards the name is in an indelible association with national so socialism. Could he get a mm. job? No. You know, he he couldn't do anything. And, you know, when I speak to my mum about this, she's like, why didn't he change his name? And I was like, yeah, where the hell didn't he? You know, one of his wives had taken their only daughter over to Southern America. and They never saw each other again. I thought, why didn't he even say go over there and find her but he just kind of carried on living and apparently he was even generous until the very end he married his housekeeper on his deathbed so that she would receive would all of his pension money. like how even though that's so kind and, and as we we were talking about earlier on we do that you know he, it was really upon his death that his anti-Nazi exploits kind of became widely known. And the point I kind of want to finish on in terms of looking at maybe a legacy, and I think it's very interesting in terms of how people obviously analyse history and perceptions of it, but there's a historian, um, William Hastings Burke, and he actually made a case in Israel for Albert to have received the Israel's highest order, uh, well, highest honour of a non-Jewish person, which is a bit like kind of Schindler, in the sense that Albert could be recognised as one of the righteous among the nations for the efforts he did for the Jewish people. So it's really, again, that, you know, if if they're interpreting this in that sense, you think, wow, like, it's, oh, it's just a fascinating story. But, but there's also this argument that, that he didn't do enough to get, because that righteousness... Well, like I said. Is, is, ...is a big thing, and you... you there's, you don't get in if you aren't 100% there. And there are these questions, we did he really do enough? I, I like the point Andrew Moody said earlier about if you do good in the midst of the Nazi regime and you don't have means of proving it afterwards, you're an idiot. Albert clearly wasn't. So, so yeah, this document, a it's a good point. Yeah, if, if, you've, if, you, if you haven't got means of proving it, pr proving it, it's just a story. It's just an anecdote. And my point, yeah. when you said about him not changing his name, the thing is, we now know 
that in the 50s and 60s, that a while, even late 40s, there are lots of high, well, not lots, there are, there are various high ranking Germans who have done really bad shit, who are chasing, changing their names to escape from their crimes. Mm -hmm. So maybe he thought that if he changes his name to get a better job, what it's actually doing is painting himself as being trying to deny who he was. And it seems to, to me, whatever he was, wherever he is on that scale of being good to bad, he's not going to deny who he is. He's not ever going to say, yeah. look, I'm not a guru. He, I am a guru. Herman is my brother. I am part of this. I did what I can. He's he's honest. He's honest with who he is. Um, the other question, um, and, and Brian Yee asked, I'm going to say word it slightly differently is, you know, what were Albert's thoughts about Herman being imprisoned? I'm going to add the bit to that. Did Albert try and step in in any way and help his brother? I mean, obviously, it's a lost cause because Herman is a murdering fuckwit. Yeah. But, you know, but exactly. <laughs> um, there's not really exactly. much you can do. But did he do anything to try and, you know, even on a compassionate, you know, to help him out with food parcels or anything? Or what? what not is there I've read. That or? No, not that I've come across, and I'd love it if, if anyone has, you know, please inform us. If the, the only thing I did see is that the last time I mentioned, the last time they both saw each other was in this prison in Germany, mm -hmm. and they both kind of said this goodbye to each other in a way, and Herman was like, you know, please look after my wife and children. Um, you know, it was kind of one of those, like, I think they knew that was the final goodbye. And so yeah. maybe that Albert kind of, like, look what I said at the very beginning. Oh, my God, my my brother's involved with this bastard Hitler. And if he carries on, it's not going to end good for him. He foreshadowed that, completely yeah. foreshadowed that. And I think deep down, maybe when it comes to Nuremberg, Albert knew that this was a lost cause. Yeah. You know, what could you, what effort could you do? And maybe if he did defend her, at Herman, well, then it looked like he's siding with him. So why would you want to defend someone who's done so much shit, as you've said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then how bad would that look on you? You don't want to be bigging up and trying to help someone who clearly has got one of the worst war criminal kind of records on their heads. Yeah, like. I, I think Albert thinks that Herman has made his own bed so he can damn yeah, well lie he's lying it. it. And, yeah. in, and in the same sense, Albert is prepared to defend his own position, saying, here's what I did. Yes, I was at Skoda. Yes, I didn't deny I'm at Skoda. I was helping people. I was doing what I can. You know, judge me mm -hmm. on what I did, and that's it. I'll, I'll exactly. give, me a, give me a fair hearing. And and the fact is, when we say is he good or bad, he wasn't found guilty of war crimes. He was released, so he he is innocent of that. So therefore, yeah. he's he's he is a good guy. And mm -hmm. as we said before, he went live and at the beginning of the show. What's so fascinating is he is a microcosm of what's happening in Germany generally because. Everybody who was in Germany or Austria or the Sudetenland is somehow partly guilty for Hitler because some people voted for him. They were part of the system. And you as an individual within that have to make your decision about where you make your stance against it. Do you, you know, yeah. you? it starts with you've got to have your license for your radio. You start with this. You've got to send your son to the Hitler Youth. You've got to do this. And, and eventually there's a line where you have to kind of go, OK, do I cross that line? Do I... Am I prepared to, you know, drive the train to, to Auschwitz, for example? When, when will I when will I make my stand? And I guess every single German who survived that war is having to analyze their own record going back over those previous 10 years and say, what did I do? Did I yeah. did I do enough? Could I have done more? And clearly Albert could have done more, but if oh, he had done definitely. more, he might have been killed by the exactly. regime he stands against. So that's why I think the enigma analogy is really interesting to be like, well, I, I know about this and I'm going to do as much as I possibly can without giving it away too much because he clearly wanted to kind of keep pushing those buttons to be like, yeah. what can I keep getting away with within my remit? Well, this is the point Ben made. Ben, ben Main made. He said uh, Albert did point the finger towards her, Himmler on points to try and detract any blame on war crimes and atrocities from Herman so that he did. Oh, that's he interesting. Did Maybe it was more like, well, he may, my brother may have been bad, but he wasn't as bad as some of the others, which... Which is, is fair enough. Which is fair enough, because... Yeah. Yeah, Hitler is worse <laughs> than Goering. It doesn't mean Goering's better, but he's not no. as shit as Hitler. And Herman and, and Himmler is worse, as, again. So there's a... And, and again, I think it's everybody's that... Again, everybody... When you see on the news about um, a murderer has been cap, uh, in, imprisoned... And they always go, if they go to the parents or the brothers, it's very mm. hard. Even if you're 
you know that your brother, your mother, your husband has done something terrible to completely ditch all that love. I mean, if, if, oh, you're, okay. if you're a parent and your kid does something awful, I, I, I defy anybody to ever stop loving their children. So mm -hmm. he probably loved his brother and he probably hated what his brother represented, but to throw your bus, brother under the bus entirely, there's a there's still there's still there's still that fraternal love that yeah of course and, and, and I think again it adds that level of complexity to it yeah and I I like what you said about everything kind of points towards him that he just seemed honest you know and I think maybe that element of being honest around your family and just kind of being like well you know he's my brother what what's there to do I think that's just a natural maybe human kind of reaction to this if anything yeah. if you can analyze it in that sense there's just so much depth here that it can be analyzed i think that's that's why it's such a fascinating topic yeah and and there's another point so contradicting what i said there super doctor 14 mm -hmm. said in a way herman's crime was worse in that he because he didn't hate jews that much and he was you know so he was a bit ambivalent about it he's not yeah. some of the people in the third reich are just hateful and they're idiots they're just they're not very bright people <laughs> who have the Goerings clearly aren't stupid. Herman's not no. an idiot. He's an intelligent guy. He was awarded the Blue Max in the First World War. You know, he's 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 been a gallant person in his life, and he chooses this. S some some Nazis were swept up by it because they just aren't bright enough to stand up against it. Um, Rommel comes to mind about whether he's a good German or a bad German. That's another yeah. show for another day. You know, the where Rommel sits yeah. on that line. Um, but yeah, it's Albert is whatever he is. He I think he he's honest to himself. He 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 lives yeah. openly. He didn't change his name. It does now, as I say, the way you that point you made of of the fact his name then becomes this millstone round his neck. R rightly, I mean it, you know yeah, the Guru yeah, name yeah, is associated with lots of evil. Yeah. But as I say, he didn't change it. Didn't didn't it, it it may have served him better to change it. But then maybe as I said, it makes him look like he's trying to hide something. Mm. Um, it's it's it, the Albert Goring story is more than just Albert Goring. It's a, yeah. it's a examination of everybody's own moral compass, isn't it? Really, I think. Without, yeah, definitely, that really is. Which is probably the the best way to end it. Really, is is that if we want to judge him, which we are entitled to, we must also judge ourselves on this planet and how we do things and how we 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 are with everything and every decision we make. And and mm. you know he he. He did stuff to help people. People survived the war because of Albert, but he also made had made tanks to kill people. So, you know, that's that's the reality. I mean, they're, yeah. they're just Colin Taylor just reminded me that the guns ten miles away from my house at Long Sommer were made by Skoda. Actually, that was before before Albert was there. But that that yeah that doesn't, doesn't lessen the argument. But the involvement, a, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, that's why you can weigh it up. It, the joys it, it, of history. It, it, it become it becomes a, a case study of it's a really good it'd be a good one to put to kids, isn't it? Really, and say, okay, is this guy a good yeah. guy or a bad guy? You know, and I in fact I think when we go when I finish this, I will go on Twitter and say, okay, for those who watched the show, did you know about Albert before it? If you did, did you have an opinion? Has your mm. opinion changed because of this? Have you? Uh, and if so, why? <laughs> and if you have, if your opinion hasn't changed, if so, why? Because. I just think that's interesting. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I agree. I and I bet, agree. I bet the, if we do that, and I will do it, I'll do it in 10 minutes' time, the, 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 the responses will be different and varied because some people will judge him harshly and some people will say, you know, I think he's a good guy. And that's, yeah, that's, and that's fine. That's interpretation, debate, interpretation. and history. That's all it is. <laughs> Well, I've been thoroughly enjoyed talking to Olivia. It's just it's been a oh, it's been a great you. presentation, and it allows us to study so much more than than just the, this this interesting guy and. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so um, thanks for joining us. So I'm just gonna do my little piece to the camera, and I'll say I'll come back and say goodbye in a minute. So, folks, um, tomorrow's show with Liberty Phillips, I've had to postpone it for various reasons. I will try and bring it back in later on. I don't know when that will be exactly. So, it's now a skipper day till Wednesday when we have two shows for you. So, in the afternoon, four o'clock, we've got Ellen Hampton coming on talking about the Rochon Bell, who are a French nursing unit who got attached to the French Second Armour Division, General Leclerc's division, and they were the only female unit attached to an armour division of World War II, which is kind of cool. And then later that day, um, uh, Samantha Cowan is joining us from Canada to talk about remembrance tourism, how has visiting cemeteries um, and museums changed over decades, and how will it be 
post COVID when we can hopefully have a world post COVID. So that'll be interesting. So join us on those ones on Wednesday. Don't forget links to Olivia in the, in the description below, go and check out some of Olivia's podcasts yourself with Kaki Malaki. Go and read more about Albert Goring and find yourself like I am conflicted as to what kind of guy he had lots more to do. But, um, Meanwhile, thank you very much for joining us, Olivia. It wasn't as bad as you. Is that all that you were? You weren't that nervous. It was good, wasn't it? <laughs> I was good. You made me relax. So yeah, like, well, we, we try the and make it friendly. And yeah, it was good viewing numbers and people enjoyed it. Or, or, and, and I think people will go and, away going, I still don't know what I think about that guy. And that's, that's fine. That's the joy that's, of it. That's the joy of it. You don't have to make a conclusion. No. Um, you can just discuss things and go round about. And, and that's what I like about this video format is if you're doing a book on Albert Goring as an author, you've kind of got to make your closing statement and say, I, author, think that he's mm. a good – we can just leave it open-ended because it's a video. Yeah. It's YouTube. We can just we go – We want the yeah. debate to keep going. We want to hear people's thoughts. Keep it going. Uh, yeah, comment. So will, Let us know. We'd love I to know. I will put that on Twitter in, in a few minutes' time and we'll just start a debate saying, where is he? Uh, give him a score out of 10 on the goodness scale, you know, and – We'll do that. <laughs> right. Thanks for joining us, Olivia. Thanks, everybody else, Thank for watching. You. I will see you all on Wednesday for two more shows. So this is Paul Woodhouse and Olivia Smith for World War II TV. See you on Wednesday. Bye, everybody. Bye.